Um, so when I was invited to this session, I read the questions that were uh, going to be asked. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to use an example from my own experience uh, in using strategic communications and sort of answer those three questions in a very pragmatic way, uh, and then maybe a couple of thoughts uh, toward the end. I could have used my experiences in Afghanistan, and I'm happy to do that during the question and answering, uh, because I think I have a few things to say about that. But I want to use a little bit more of an emotive uh, example, and that's when I was uh, in Canada in my last job as the commander of the strategic response team on sexual misconduct. So please bear with me on the topic. It is an important topic uh, for many of our nations, but I would like to sort of expand upon the way that we use strategic communications in the development of that topic. So just a little bit of background first, um, and this was um, something that came out of the media. So a huge media spread in the national magazines in Canada, both in French and en français, uh, sorry, in English and in French. Uh, our national magazines came out with these uh, commentaries, these very large spreads on sexual misconduct in the Canadian Armed Forces. Very difficult, very emotional topic uh, for all of us to, uh, to experience. Um, but when they were on the front page, uh, it was very difficult as well for us not to do something in a very pragmatic sense. So I was assigned by the uh, commander or the CDS at the time um, to develop, put a team together and to address the issue. Um, and uh, in doing that, even before that, we had a, a justice minister go out and talk to a number of people and she wrote up a report and our job was to actually address the report. So that's just a little bit of the background. So in the setup of um, when the report came out, the setup was pretty easy. I find a strategist uh, that could help me with strategies and to bring things forward. I, I found a planner that helped me put an uh, action team together. Uh, but the third line that I got, um, which was almost more fundamental than the first two, was a strategic communicator that I brought in as a contractor, an uh, ex-military guy. Uh, and um, we used him uh, profusely throughout the experience to really help us set the tone. And the very first thing that we had to do was create a narrative. Now you would say that the narrative was already out there. The narrative was provided to us by these national magazines. But the fact is we needed to create our own narrative on how we were going to address it. So we needed a short-term and a long-term narrative and he was actually fundamental to that. And in developing the narrative, that helped us identify the strategies and the planning that we needed to go ahead uh, and, uh, and to do. Now the planning, uh, had to be very comprehensive, which had to be part of the narrative because we were going to tackle this on many, many venues, not just in terms of uh, addressing uh, potential uh, offenders, but addressing the system, the systemic problems that actually uh, were behind it. So we had to, we had to put those two together. Um, and uh, so let me just go to the comm strategy now. In developing the comm strategy, so we had this narrative a short-term and a long-term strategic narrative that we put, uh, put forth. And it was fundamentally important, and I think it was essential to success of this particular mission, that the whole chain of command had a buy-in to not just the narrative, but to the problem set, the fact that there was a problem, and then what we needed to do in order to address it. So those were, in my humble opinion, the pivotal aspects of the strategic communication plan. Ownership by the chain of command. From the, chief, uh, from the chief of the defense staff all the way down to the unit commanders uh, throughout the entire Canadian forces. And it had to start at the top and it had to go all the way down. And in fact, what happened was, was also leadership from the bottom moving its way up. So in the short term, uh, we had to get the message out. So there's a tremendous amount of communications as those of you who are professional communicators know, we needed to get the message out on what we were doing and what the action plan also uh, talked about. But we also needed to identify what best practices were, so we created the environment where we went around, I went uh, to many countries that uh, probably many of yours uh, came to visit you to figure out uh, what was the best way in order to tackle this insidious behavior. And we had to incorporate that to the, into the, not just in the narrative, but into the action plan. And then I had to do something which was a little bit more difficult, and that was go to the town halls across the country uh, and to speak to 30, thousand Canadian Armed Forces members, uh, about uh, a third of the Canadian Forces population, and to discuss everything that had happened and to impress upon both the leadership of their responsibilities 
uh, and to impress upon uh, the members of the Canadian Armed Forces what is behavior that will and will not be uh, taken. So in the short term, that's what we did in terms of the communication strategy. In the long term, we had to create an, a, a comprehensive approach. We had four lines of operation. The first was understand, uh, understand what the situation is. I think we all understand what the problem is, but we had to understand how it affect people, understand best practices and the like. Second one was really respond uh, to incidences in a very timely and, uh, and uh, uh, resourceful way. The third was uh, to support the victims of this, uh, of this misconduct. And then the fourth one, of course, is to ensure that it was prevented and that we weren't going to be having to deal with it again in another 10 years' time. And all of those required a very steadfast and very, um, uh, I would say, pragmatic, tangible communication strategy that we had to use throughout the entire endeavor. Um, so the chain of command aspect, uh, and I would say that strategic communications is owned by the chain of command. Um, the, the CDS at the time, uh, in fact, the CDS that just started, who is the current CDS, actually literally brought the senior leadership of the Canadian Armed Forces uh, to Ottawa. So all colonels, formation commanders and above, and their chief foreign officers, we literally sat in a room and we talked about it, and we, and we ensured that the narrative was consistent with what everybody believed because they had to believe, A, that there was a problem, and I think the general mentioned this uh, as a, in terms of the nation's, uh, nation's military capacity, but they had to believe that there was a problem, they had to believe that there was a solution set to that problem, and then they had to believe that they had a part to play in that problem. And all of that actually came around in terms of the, our ability to communicate that in, in many, many ways. And it wasn't just through the written documents, it was through uh, personal engagements, one-on-ones, it was through group engagements, it was through um, uh, action plan development, and of course uh, through uh, the more, the more off-the-shelf type of media engagements uh, that we were faced with. I, we still have a big problem, uh, as most nations do, but I think we're, we're getting there, and I think we took the right turns in many ways. We saw an increase in reporting, which is a little counterintuitive, uh, probably to many of us, but when things start to get better, people report them a little bit more readily. I would like to just mention a couple of things in my last two minutes left, things to consider. The information management. In this particular phase, it became abundantly clear that information management was absolutely uh, essential to ensure that the narrative was correct, that the people were saying the right thing, and that the information was steadfast between the CDS and down to the unit commanders. We need to embrace uh, what's out there in terms of information management. So it wasn't just the word, it wasn't just uh, through personal engagement, it was through a social media outlets, it was through all of those other things that you spoke about today and yesterday, uh, and it's using to the betterment of the organization. And we had to um, create trust, and a trust in a value-based system and a value-based organization because when you create trust, you increase, uh, when you have increased trust, you have reduced risk. And I think that can be extended to any of the operations we have, uh, militarily or otherwise. If you could increase the trust that the people that are leading the effort are doing the right thing, your nations are doing the right thing, you will have a reduced risk of people taking the wrong decisions and working unilaterally uh, on in another venue. And the last point I would like to talk about is the say-do gap. It is fundamentally important that that gap be reduced uh, as much as possible. In this particular environment, it was, it was difficult, and I have to say we did not succeed, because when people, some people continue to do the insidious behavior, and what it did was it created question marks and a lack of trust in the, in the people uh, when they could see what we're saying, and yet it was still, we were still being faced with uh, with the behavior that we are trying to get rid of. Even though the behavior was reduced, even one episode or one incident puts a lot of the extra, uh, actual effort and positive uh, movement that we're doing uh, and, and moves, it to the, moves it to the back. So the say-do gap is fundamental uh, to success in any strategic communication uh, environment. I will leave it at that. Uh, my time's up, anyway. Uh, I will leave it at that, and uh, I look forward to your questions. Thank you.